Hello, my name is Christopher Barney, and I am the visiting uh, assistant professor in game design. I will be teaching your course this semester, and hmm, there we go. That course ha, is level design and game architecture, um, understanding how to build games. So. Click. There we go. Uh, course materials. Um, this course will use a number of different documents. Uh, one is the class spreadsheet, which you'll be able to refer to uh, to see who's in the class, who's on what team in the class, and um, to make sure that I have access to your readings and assignments document. Your readings and assignments document, <clears throat> which you'll make based off of the template. Um, and then there's course syllabus. Uh, the syllabus is the same for both sections of the course, uh, but it's in Canvas in two different places, one for each course. So section one and section two are linked here in the slides. Um, and uh, the slides and the syllabus, of course, are um, all linked in Canvas. So it's all a big circle. Uh, text for the course. We are going to be reading the book An Architectural Approach to Level Design by Christopher Totten. We're reading the second edition of that uh, book. The library has two different versions of the first edition. Those are not the right book. Uh, they have much of the same material, but the chapters are headed differently and you'll inevitably read the wrong thing at the wrong time or be confused. So make sure that the version you um, are reading says second edition on the cover of the book. It's very prominent, can't miss it. If it doesn't say second edition on the cover, you've got the wrong version, keep looking. Uh, it should be available in the library. I did put in a request for the new edition, it should be in and available for you. We'll also be reading excerpts from A Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander. The slide here links to a PDF that is 300 pages long and is about a third of the book. Um, it's enough for you to get by on, but the library does have the full book available and um, it's in paperback. I recommend picking it up. Uh, it's something worthwhile to have as a reference. <clears throat> we'll also be reading uh, sections from my book, Pattern Language for Game Design, and using exercises out of that book. So you also need to pick that one up. Um, I recommend a physical edition of that book as opposed to a digital. Uh, the formatting and stuff in the digital version is just not as clear as in the print version. So I recommend picking up uh, the book in print. Um, and then recommended is uh, Pattern Theory 101 by Helmut Leitner. Um, it is a summary book of about 100 and so pages long that gives an overview of pattern theory uh, in design. And uh, if you're struggling with patterns at all in the class, we'll talk about those in a bit. Um, but I recommend Pattern Theory 101 as something to give you a good, concise overview if you're struggling at all. Uh, websites for the book, uh, the Pattern Library, you'll see referenced in your assignments. You'll be recording some work there and reading patterns from it. Um, so that is a website that goes along with the Pattern Language for Game Design book. And then there is a Game Design Patterns collection, um, which is by Stefan Bjork. Um, no relation to the singer, I don't think, but he's put together a collection of 800 or so game design patterns that are not quite the same as what we'll be doing in this class, but uh, may be very useful for you. So, class one. Uh, so for this first class, uh, we'll be doing in-class introductions. Uh, and in the lecture, I'm going to be going over the syllabus and course structure um, and uh, covering sort of an overview of what the course is like. So you can have a sense when you walk into class for the first time what you're getting into. So. Course overview and setting expectations. Uh, what is this course? Uh, level design and game architecture. So that is an overview of how architecture applies to game level design, um, which you might expect, but it's also a little bit about design architecture in games. Not the software architecture of games, but how we structure our designs and what different parts of our designs do and how they're necessary. Um, Hopefully that will become, that distinction will become clear as we go forward. The course is divided into three parts. Um, there is the readings and lectures uh, that you will listen to videos of the lectures and, and do the readings each week. In class, we'll be doing exercises 
to build uh, a pattern language, to look at the games we understand, find design patterns in them, um, and create uh, shareable patterns that the whole class can use. And then there'll be uh, applied design exercises, which is we're going to take those patterns and we're going to build levels. Uh, we'll build seven levels uh, that are one week long exercises uh, in groups. And then uh, there'll be a final project that is a month long that you'll work with your group and have uh, a more substantial uh, project at the end of it. What this course is not, this course is not a tutorial in using Unity or Unreal Engine 4 or 5. Um, if you want those kind of resources, uh, there's a link here to a course at lynda.com, uh, one at udemy.com. I've been through the Unity one, it's great. Um, if you are uncertain about using the Unity development environment, which is the preferred and required for this course uh, program uh, environment, then I strongly recommend going through one of those tutorials. Uh, they're 30 odd hours long. Uh, if they try to charge you more than 20 bucks for them, check back later or look for a different one. They should be around $20 on Udemy and I think you have access to Linda for free. So recommend looking at those. This is not a tutorial on modeling or how to you know, use a CAD CAM software to create architectural models. Uh, that's, not, that's not what this course is about, though you will be expected to do that, uh, not the CAD CAM part in Unity. Um, and then this is also not a primer on basic game design. Uh, I expect that if you're coming into this course, you have some familiarity with game design, you've had some courses in it, uh, foundations for game design course, at least something like that. So you'll understand if I say MDA, what I mean, if I say, you know, the different types of fun, what I mean. You should have a basic grasp. Um, you don't need to have a high level technical understanding of implementing games in engine, um, but you need to be able to create basic architecture in, in an engine starting out. Um, and we'll be talking about what you should create, um, how to create it is left uh, to you. So. From the syllabus, so uh, readings are due at the start of each course. So when you come into class for the first time um, on Thursday next week, you should have already done the reading for the week. Um, and then going forward, if you're in the uh, Monday section, then you should have done the reading by Monday. If you're in the Thursday section by Thursday, uh, coming into class, because I'm going to ask questions of everyone in the class about the reading, and uh, it's going to be evident if you haven't done it. So you should have done your reading, written your reflection by the time you come to class. For the first class that you are listening to this lecture in front of, because it's recorded ahead of time, um, you should read An Architectural Approach to Level Design Chapter 1, which is a brief history of architecture and level design in games. Um, it's easy to know what to read from that book because each week you are going to be reading the chapter that is the same number. So week 1, Chapter 1, week 2, Chapter 2, week 13, Chapter 13. Um, so pretty straightforward. Uh, you'll also for this week be reading Pattern Language for Game Design Chapter 5. Um, the introductory chapter, chapters are background and sort of academic theory. Chapter 5 is the first practical chapter in the book. So you'll be reading that. Recommended reading is um, Chapter 8, which is the exercise for creating basic patterns. Uh, that's recommended reading because it walks you through the process of solving that exercise or completing it. And we'll be doing that exercise in class. So you should, if you've read that chapter, you'll, or that section of chapter eight, not all of chapter eight, just the section on the basic patterns, um, then you'll, you'll be ahead, you'll understand what I'm talking about for the exercise. So I recommend doing that. And then lastly, for this week, you're going to read the using this book section of a pattern language by Christopher Alexander. That's also like 30 to 40 pages. So there's a ton of reading this week. Um, absolutely, I get it. Giving you a notice ahead of time, you've had access to the syllabus ahead of time and known that this is due. Um, this is the heaviest reading week that you'll have this semester by far, uh, front loading a lot of it so that you can come hit the ground running and we can get moving. Um, so if you can make it through the reading this week, the rest of the, the course should be a breeze in terms of uh, how much you have to read. Lecture topics this week, introductions uh, in class, we'll do that. Um, and syllabus, uh, course structure and grading. Uh, I'll introduce patterns in this lecture. And then in our class activity uh, on, on the course day, we'll be forming teams, uh, we'll be identifying high level meta design patterns and then uh, design elements. And then we'll be talking about what problems those elements solve 
and distilling patterns that provide solutions to those problems. Um, that's going to be exercise two. And then your homework for the week will be to complete exercise two and actually produce uh, patterns as explained uh, in the text and in class. So introductions. Uh, I'll go ahead and introduce myself now. Uh, I'm Christopher Barney. Uh, I am a game designer for more than a decade. I've been teaching here at Northeastern. Uh, I was a lecturer for a while and, and now I'm a uh, visiting uh, assistant professor. And um, my background is industry more than academia. Uh, I've got my degrees in game design, but I spent six years working for the company that made the video game Pop Tropica, which is a side-scroller kids uh, online MMO. And I did most of the, um, the server-side work for that, uh, along with my uh, boss and mentor, uh, Dan Franklin, who is a, a great programmer, taught me so much. Um, so I, I uh, worked with him, built the background, built the social layers, uh, social grid for that game. Um, and uh, a lot of the stuff that allowed you to save characters uh, to, for levels to be saved and so on. Um, and then uh, from there, I spent a bunch of time lecturing at Game Developers Conference, uh, San Francisco, um, East Coast Game Developers Conference, uh, DevCom, so all over the world, uh, talking about games and design. Started teaching here at Northeastern, uh, been working as an independent game developer, doing largely physical games and uh, live action games and uh, teaching. And so about two years ago, I started working on a book on game design patterns. Um, that book has been published and you're now using it as part of the course. So hopefully that will be useful to you. Moving on here, assignments policy. Um, assignment for each week are due by the beginning of class. So you should have done the reading by the beginning of class, written your reflection, if there were exercises from the previous week that were assigned, they're due by the beginning of class the next week. Um, so turn those in on time. If you turn them in late, um, they're still going to get some credit, but it will be reduced you know, more and more the later they're turned in. Uh, always it will be better to turn in the exercise, uh, even if it's at the last minute than not at all. But I'll be able to give you feedback sooner incorporate what you don't understand into lectures if you tell me, uh, or if you turn the, the work in on time uh, and I'm able to read it ahead of class. So please do that. If for whatever reason, and there's lots of reasons these days that you might not be able to complete an assignment on time, you have to tell me ahead of time that you need an extension on it. I'm pretty generous with giving you those, um, giving you the time to get your work done. But if you tell me in class or the next week, oh, I need more time, then I think you just decided not to do the work. If you tell me, hey, I've had, you know, I'm sick or I'm having internet trouble or I'm on the road or, or whatever's going on the week before, then I can know and that's fine. Uh, you can see the evaluation, the percentages for everything um, here. Um, class, particip class participation is only 15%, but part of my understanding that you've done the readings and assignments is you being able to talk about those in class. So you one, have to be in class to do that, and two, you need to be able to respond to my questions about the readings and assignments during class time. So uh, participation says only 15%, but that doesn't mean if you never show up, you could still get uh, an 85% in the class. That won't be the case. So course overview and structure. A little bit complicated course structure um, because there's so much material we cover. The um, the readings and uh, uh, reading assignments that you're going to be doing cover the basic information on architecture and game design. Um, Christopher Totten's book, uh, Architectural Approach to Level Design, is a great text that covers a ton of basic material that you should know. Um, but it's all stuff that I pretty much think that you can get from the book. So I'm going to assign the readings, ask you questions to make sure you understand, and, and that should be pretty, pretty much take care of itself. In the lectures, I'm going to talk about some of the things that are covered in the book, but also other things that are around those ideas that I think are relevant to game design um, or interesting in terms of the history of architecture and how we might apply it to game design. Um, lectures I'm going to record ahead of time so that you can watch them before we come to class. Uh, the reason for that, even though we have this really long class period, is that I don't want to be staring at a bunch of black boxes that have your names on them while I give a lecture. 
and have you have no um, interaction. So this way you can watch the lecture ahead of time. You can put it on 1.5 speed or whatever, make me sound like a chipmunk and, uh, and get that material covered so that in class we can talk about it and you can focus on having time for your exercises. Uh, doing it this way comes from previous student feedback. You know, hey, the lectures are great, but it's too bad we have to waste time for them, waste time on them in class. Um, so I'm trying to make the time that I'm available to you in person, time that you can be actively interacting with me, not just listening to me go on and on. Um, the class activities, um, I'm going to be calling on you guys to all to talk about your the readings and lectures, um, and you'll be working on exercises, sometimes alone, a lot of times in, in your project groups. Uh, building a pattern language, we're going to be applying the work of Christopher Alexander um, through reading the, the text that I wrote um, and creating our own game design patterns. I'll talk to you about those in a second. And then the group level building projects are things that you'll have a little time to work on in class, but mostly you'll be working on between class, and that will be actually implementing um, you know, designs for, for levels in game. They'll start off as very simple, gray box, no mechanics, just show me the layout of of a scene and they'll escalate to you know more complicated uh, scenes towards the end of class. So that's that's the overall structure of what we're doing. All right, so what is a pattern language? Um, Alexander said designs, uh, all designs exist to provide solutions to problems. And I think that's really key, understanding that designs, design elements, techniques that we um, put into games. Um, they aren't just there uh, to provide their functionality, right? Um, so adding shooting to a game isn't just there to provide shooting to a game. It provides a deeper meaning. Uh, implementing a rocket launcher in a game uh, isn't just implementing a rocket launcher. Uh, it changes the way the game plays. Um, you need to understand why you're doing that, what problem you're solving by introducing that weapon type, by introducing that core verb to your game. Why are you choosing that for your game? It may not be the right verb. Um, if you're putting elements in just because you're familiar with them, then it's like designing with your eyes closed. You're, you're never really going to understand what kind of game you're getting out the other end. So design, um, all design solves problems. Um, in a pattern language, each pattern is a proposed solution to a design problem. So you take a, uh, you have a problem in your design. I want to create a game that, uh, that players find, um, you know, evokes an emotion of wistfulness. Like I want to create, create a game that creates that experience for players. That's my design problem. I'm trying to create an emotional state. Well, what mechanics should I use to do that? What kind of art style should I use to do that? Um, you could try to come up with ideas on your own and you know, you might be right. Or you could look at patterns that are about how different elements evoke different kinds of emotions and start with a leg up and with a sense of what you should be doing. Pattern languages are connected sets of patterns so that you can have, no game has just one design problem. Games are a mass of you know, interconnected design problems and uh, patterns are interconnected in the same way so that you can add more and more patterns to your design in order to solve related sets of problems. Um, so this course is going to start at high level patterns and work our way down to more and more specific patterns. So pattern language is more than just a collection of patterns. Patterns have to be connected together. Uh, some patterns, the ones we were working on in the beginning of class are gonna be high level. Um, in architecture, that might address a problem like, where should I build a city? Uh, in a game, it might address a problem like, you know, what is the plot of this game? What is the setting of the game? What's the core mechanic of the game? And then uh, some patterns are very specific, like, you know, uh, what is the placement of power-ups uh, in uh, the levels and how does that change over the course of the game? So it's a, a very specific technical question, and there would be patterns that would address that. Um, the patterns fit together into a hierarchy. Some patterns only work if you have other higher level patterns present. For example, if you had a pattern about where you place uh, power-ups to the jump ability, then that only makes sense in a game that has movement and traversal. 
uh, jump power ups don't make any sense in Tetris, right? So if you, you have to have a game that has a higher level pattern governing movement, and then your pattern governing movement modifying power ups is going to be a child pattern of that. Um, so all of the patterns fit together into you know something like a skill tree uh, or a graph structure. There's often you know patterns have multiple parents, patterns have multiple children, so you end up with this complicated um, rhizome of uh, interconnected patterns. So an example for that. Um, so the idea of how, this is an example of how you might come up with a pattern in general. I give you much more specific processes uh, in the course itself. So. Uh, if you had the design problem that players' skill grow over the, skills grow over the course of play, um, one solution to that problem might be, all right, so we're going to break the game up into a bunch of levels, and each level we're going to make harder than the previous level, so that as the player's skill grows, he's always presented with new challenges that keep the game interesting and engaging. Um, but another designer might say, uh, well, we're going to take the play space and we're going to have a, a play space that you can always access all of it, but we're going to introduce new elements to that space dynamically. And those elements are going to be more and more challenging to overcome so that the player, even though they're always occupying the same place throughout, uh, throughout the course of the game is constantly challenged. And you would end up with, you know, open world design or Metroidvania kind of design in a game like that, where in something like Skyrim, the creatures are easy at the beginning in the same area later in the game, you're facing different set of creatures or more powerful creatures that can still provide a challenge for you. Um, so those are two really different solutions to the same problem. And, uh, but they both are reliant on the same underlying principle. So you look at a problem like this, player skills grow over the course of play. You look at a bunch of different games that deal with that in different ways whether it be basic level design, Metroidvania style skill progression, um, you know, open world style scaling difficulty, um, you know, all, all the different possible solutions to it, um, describe those and then try to distill that into a general rule. In this case, that might be something like uh, in a game that's intended to be played over dozens of hours, the play space must change in order to maintain a level of challenge that's interesting to the player. And that describes both of, both or all of the uh, above uh, solutions. And with that advice, you can create your own solutions that are more likely to work that aren't necessarily found in any of the games that you started out by looking at. All right. So uh, last thing here is that remote learning is hard. And the work that we're doing in this class is challenging. Um, in past semesters, I've had students uh, say that they have difficulty learning to interact either in a fast-paced real classroom or, you know, due to being online. Um, and I want to make this course as manageable as possible for everyone. So um, ideally, I want you all to feel comfortable participating in the classroom portion of the course actively. I want this to be a dialogue, not just me talking at you. Um, and I've had students say they have difficulty responding in front of large groups, that they have, you know, especially if they're working not in their uh, first language, difficulty understanding fast-paced lectures, that they have connectivity problems. Um, so I have some ideas about things I can do each semester to try to mitigate that. Uh, I have you working in smaller groups so that I can bounce between groups and talk to you more individually. Um, I'll often say, hey, you know, raise your hand on camera or, you know, with the icon to let me know that you've heard and understood a thing that I've said. I'll pause and ask questions. Um, I'm trying this semester recording the lectures ahead of time. So if I'm going too fast, you can listen to them again. You can listen to them more slowly um, to get that part of the material. Um, and I'm hoping that listening to this ahead of time, you can all give it a little bit of thought, take 10 minutes. Um, and be prepared to make at least one comment uh, in chat uh, or in your readings and assignments document about what you would like me to do to try to make the class more easily understandable to you. All right, I'm going to step really quickly through the rest of the slides here uh, that we'll be looking at in class, but class will start and we'll pretty much pick up from this point and go through the rest of the lecture. So we're going to form teams. Uh, we'll do that in a uh, group exercise. And uh, I will ask you some questions about the readings and lecture. 
Um, we're going to do an exercise where you're going to tell me about yourself. And then we're going to do an exercise where you will work through generating a basic pattern. Um, you'll do that in your groups, though you'll be generating individual patterns. Um, you'll be able to ask each other questions. Your assignments for the week um, are going to, uh, well, no. Uh, we'll be, yes, we'll be reading Pattern Language for Game Design chapter one, which is the introductory chapter, talks about what the book is for. Um, and it will give you some context for what we've been doing. Then uh, we're going to read Architectural Approach to Level Design Chapter 2, which is about drawing for designers. You're going to be expected to do a bunch of sketching in this class. I'm not interested in the quality of the art, just that you're communicating with pictures. Um, you need to write a paragraph response to uh, each of those readings, as well as um, reading one, of, one pattern from a pattern language a uh, book by Christopher Alexander, and writing a paragraph in response. Your paragraph should tell me that you understand uh, what the pattern says and uh, maybe give some suggestions for how you might apply it to game design. Um, you need to complete exercises one and two. Those need to be um, in your readings and assignments document for class the second week. You'll be uh, entering the pattern you found in the pattern library. We'll go over that in class. Um, the website lets you submit, submit patterns and form groups, and, and we'll talk about that actually in class. And then um, I want you to connect with your teammates and say hi. So, um, you know, get to understand how you're going to work together, whether you're going to be communicating via Zoom meetings or via Skype or Discord, uh, figuring out how you're going to talk to your teammates uh, and work on projects remotely. So that will be what you do um, after class this week. All right, I look forward to seeing you all on Thursday. Have a good weekend.